Good evening, everyone in this room and uh, behind the cameras online watching us. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to this session of the Bath of Wisdom Lectures, which is special this time, special in uh, two ways. First of all, we'll be speaking in English this time. And the second reason for this being very special is that today, instead of one very special man, we have two very special men in the studio. On my right here is uh, Günter Pauli, on my left is Ingvar Willido. And usually in this situation I would say a few words about each of you, but since today's topic is innovation, I thought that let's kick it off differently and maybe I'll give the chance to each of you to introduce the other, if that's okay with you. Other, you mean? Yeah. I can introduce him. Yes. And why don't what we surprise. start with you, Ingvar? So with who, me. Is, who is Günter Bauli? Günter is an innovator. Yeah, I'm very, very glad to be here with you and uh, admiring your work. Yeah, that nice, those nice things which are you done around the globe. And uh, how I say, it it's fits to me. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think that's it. Great man to make big changes. First, a correction. He's exaggerating. In what sense? Oh, it's, he's saying too many good things. But uh, <laughs> uh, what, what I think is important about Ingvar is really his capacity to inspire people and to go beyond the simple material, the simple today, the simple questions of life. And, and as a a great writer, because I've been able to write, you read your work. Um, I think you are someone who plays a very particular leadership role. So you're a leader and an inspiration. Thank you. Thank you both for this. Yeah. And, and who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. To innovate, we will ask who are you? Yeah. I'm the dumb one in, in between. <laughs> my name is Christian Jung. <laughs> and we'll see what my role will be, because uh, I uh, hear you. You were speaking earlier, and you're perfectly capable of, you know, kicking this off the ball between the two of you as well. But maybe I'll help you steer a bit. So, innovation. What does it, what does it mean, to you or in general? You, you were can described start. as an <laughs> as an innovator. So, uh, innovation always is about disturbance. You disturb. An innovator must disturb, because the status quo is the opposite of innovation. So an innovator will be disturbing, and an innovator will though have in his being the capacity to do good. Because in the end of the day, what we want to do with an innovation is not just to fill the pockets and get rich, uh, the objective of the innovation is to be able to make society happier and healthier. And, and that means that innovation is about ethics as well. What's in you that you want to make better? And innovation to me is automatically inspired by nature. I mean, it, it is, you can't neglect five billion years of evolution. And so the innovation is, is very often what is around you and you're ignorant about. So innovation is about disturbance. It's about recognizing the patterns in nature. And it's about uh, the final most important to me is not just to talk about it and not just to contemplate it, but to do it. Mm -hmm. Because what's the use of talking about innovation when you don't do anything with it? So the doing is also very key. And then you make a contribution with innovations. Mm. Ingvar, would you agree or...? Yes, of course I agree, um, but uh, your explanation about it was almost full, full explanation. It's very difficult to add something here. That's the reason why I'm adding just a little bit. For me, is innovation to do things in new way, to go over old ways, old thinking, old uh, reactional part, old knowing, to bring something, what we can discover and, and what can be useful for everyone. 
It's, for example, you know, once humans believed uh, Earth is the uh, middle of the universe, today we, don't, we know it's not like that, but there was one guy who discovered it, right? You know, it's Galileo, right? Was Galileo? No one knows his theory. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. But, you know, th th that uh, discovery had at uh, that time very strong uh, opposition, right? But now, if we're looking how much changes was that great understanding created uh, for us today, we will see it, it, so many changes after it happens, right? And uh, I think some kind of that rooted believing, for example, about Earth, like center of universe, need to be replaced with someone which one have so same meaning, for example. For example, uh, uh, we know what is innovation, but innovation with humans, it's not done yet. We innovating things which don't become used by us, but we are out of this innovation, actually. It would be good if someone can make some innovation with us, with humans. Because uh, that's my practical experience, change yourself and the world changes around you. And it's, it's become, I think, huge innovation. But Ingvar, that, that means that we really have to learn to unlearn. We, yes. we have to get the garbage out. We have sure. to get the baggage out. And, and I think what is very important in, in the innovation of us is, is that we realize that what we have learned has an expiration date and is not valid anymore. Because if we recognize certain patterns and recognize certain uh, processes that are obviously much better than we as humans have developed, then the most important and the most humbling step is to unlearn. And I think the unlearning is a first path. You know, you hit the point. Actually, I, I uh, teach how to become unlearned. And, uh, you know, I I'm absolutely agree with you that you said the garbage, it is garbage, actually. We don't have so many different types of garbage, it's just two. And that garbage actually hiding our capacity, capability to be innovative. It's hiding our consciousness and property of properties of consciousness and uh, you know I think it's uh, it's practical truth at that time where we are like garbage beans by uh, by learning we cannot be innovative and would be good if we can unlearn and to be innovative uh, not in some higher level but even in small level you know for example I don't know, how to do some home works differently, how to speak differently, how to act differently personally. You see, when you said Galileo, I didn't respond immediately because in that Western world, there was so much opposition that if you were saying what was being said, then you paid with your life. But the Polynesian cultures, they already long knew that the Earth was round. I mean, their navigation techniques were all based on a round Earth. Mm -hmm. And they've been navigating. They came to the Americas before even the Vikings and the Chinese arrived. And, and so they didn't have to unlearn. But unfortunately, when the devices arrived, like a GPS and, and, and even a compass, then they lost their connection with nature. And so I think it's very important that we have a very strong white man, three white men talking here, 
We have a very strong Weidmann opinion, Western opinion, and a lot of the knowledge about, for example, the Earth being round and not the center. I mean, that in the Arab culture, in the Polynesian culture before the Arab culture was already done, but we don't listen to them. We don't, uh, we consider ourselves to be here. And, and I think the unlearning is not only the unlearning of the wrong information um, and, and get rid of the garbage, it's also the unlearning of our arrogance. Because we are so sure that we know, <laughs> that by the mere fact that we are so sure we know, we cannot imagine that a Polynesian uh, could have figured this out long before us. They are not educated, right? They, they, they're barbarians, didn't you know? Of course. <laughs> they cannot do. They we have to christen them first because otherwise they can't even think and, and go to heaven. So we have really a problem in, in, our, in our unlearning is that it's the unlearning of the facts and the unlearning of what are we and where are we in the equation of life on earth. And we give ourselves too much importance. It would be good if we can unlearn believings. Facts, they're always facts. You believe or you don't believe, they're still here, you know. But believings, I think that there is a lot of garbage. You know, you, you, you told about uh, Polynesians, but I met some um, a Native American Indian chief. He was here in our place here. He was 80 plus, something like that, old, very old man. And he said how they um, become taught in the childhood. They're looking how some worm living. They're learning by looking. They're learning by looking and understanding practical way. And they become wise. They look at nature, how nature works. They become wise by looking. But today, you're going to the school, you learn book, Someone wrote those books. You even don't know who, who is that guy, but you learn it because everyone said it's a truth. And you learn it and you believe it. You never see that reality behind it. You, can, you, you never become, how say, you never have doubts to, to look. Is it truth or not? Right? And that's, sorry, garbage. So, if you're accepted to unlearn, then you only have temporary truths. The truth is temporary, because there is a moment that you contemplate it, and at that moment, this could be a truth. But since everything is bound to a form of evolution and better understanding and a higher level of consciousness, you will always be finding new things. And the discovery of the new, and that is very key in the innovation, you have to recognize that you're discovering and not inventing, because it's right. a very key. Innovation can be a discovery or an invention, but m nearly everything that we have around us today is not an invention, but a discovery, because it was invented before. Uh, Gunther, do you know, we know something about everything, right? Something, but actually we're discovering something but already existing here. And that what exists, it have already this knowledge. If we can read this knowledge, we say it's innovation or, or discovery, but how much we can read it, because everything is here, right? But we even don't think sometimes, we even don't recognize those uh, processes, for example, those things, that's why they exist, but, but they are not discovered by us yet. It means actually, if we're discovering something, it's already known. We cannot create something new, actually. We can discover things which are exist. In English, you have this beautiful word, oh, I figured it out. <laughs> you know, I, I figured it out. The, the figuring out means you have a figure. You don't have a string of words. Mm -hmm. You have a pattern. And I think it's very important that when we discover 
we actually discover patterns. And if you discover a pattern, then you can make your figures and you can start recognizing new figures, new patterns. And, and it's very important that that is done, as you were describing with the Native Americans, uh, without words. There are no words to describe a pattern. This is only a drawing you can try to put it back up. And, and that's why I think it's, uh, it's key that kids learn art, because otherwise you can't draw the patterns. And, and, and we see in so many of the cultures that the pattern is key, pattern of uh, lines and stripes on a dress or the makeups on the face uh, or the drawings on walls. Uh, we need to have a pattern recognition. And it's, it's interesting that the, the, the best early languages which we see now and the most difficult to decipher were languages in a pattern. But our intelligence has brought it to syllables and an alphabet. Yes. And that's an oversimplification. And that means that when you have this oversimplification, that means what you would consider innovations are also oversimplified. Because your language is oversimplified. If we were able to talk in, in patterns, as Leonardo da Vinci was always recognizing patterns, he was he even made writing so difficult that people had to use a mirror and, and write in reverse and speak the Firenze dialect, otherwise, you know, whatever he had written had no meaning to you. Because it was, if you look at all the codexes of uh, Da Vinci, it was always drawings and patterns. The words were not the most important. So what you're saying is that language is not an inno innovation, but a step back, rather. A block to innovation. Okay. Actually, uh, language is artificial, right? There are no it, yeah. I think so. But if you're looking about, uh, talking about patterns, patterns are processes. It means if you can recognize some patterns, you can recognize processes. And figuring, uh, figuring out, you just become a witness of processes. And the best way is to understand. If understanding coming, insights coming, you start to know process, pattern, ability to, to understand, to, 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 uh, to get insight or inspiration or uh, intuition. It's always or are connected to the patterns, processes, to the innovation. But that garbage about what we are talking here, it's actually thoughts coming disturbing process of uh, witnessing, process of understanding, emotions coming, they're actually disturbing these processes. You cannot clearly understand because you are disturbed. It would be good if we can keep that part of our discovery clear, very clear. But Ingvar, it's, it's uh as you said, with the disturbances, we are disturbed, and we should be much more disturbed, by figuring out that what we thought was the truth was not the truth anymore. I, I give you an example. Um, the question is, what comes first? Is it the heart or the blood flowing through the heart? Now we know from electrocardiograms uh, in 3D perspective that we know first there is the flow, and then the tissue grows around the flow. That's how we know that it's not a pump, but rather a regulator. Because of regulating a flow is not pumping, because it was flowing already before the tissue was around it. So when, when we started making electrocardiograms of, of little turtle eggs, you know, we, we, we realized that actually the heart started beating before there was a heart because the flow was giving the beat. And what was generating the beat? This bring that to a cardiologist is heresy. You know? Of course. Uh, this is, you know. <laughs> and this means that we can have a very fresh perspective on, on how do we deal with heart problems. Because we know that a heart was first the flow. So if you have a problem with the tissue, think about the flow before you think about the tissue. Um, I think these disturbances um, to the status quo, to the truth, to the firm belief, uh, we're convinced 
This is it. That's the truth and nothing but the truth. I mean, we need to become much better in creating the right disturbance so that becomes more flexible. I have a, another uh, example. For example, you know, everyone thinking about everything, right? It's like an uh, like unstoppable process. But if you don't think, look, everything exists, still exists. And you become a witness of reality, how it is without thinking. Because thinking process is artificial. I think everyone knows that, but even maybe don't remember it. It's taught to us, right? But if you're looking thinking process, it always goes, goes first. Words, which are describing something, what we see outside, for example, right? But if we are, con on connect are connected to the thoughts and we will believe them, we cannot see reality. But if you ask someone, can you be without thinking, people think, start to think, oh, I become crazy. It means I'm not uh, human anymore, not homo sapiens, because uh, that is our part which are making us homo sapiens, right? But, okay, but price for it, you are disconnected for re from reality. You cannot perceive it anymore directly. It always goes to the, through filter of thinking, and emotional reaction, reactions, responses to the reality. If you're thinking, no, then you're doing... I don't think, thank you. No, if, Sorry. You, <laughs> if you were a person who is thinking... Oh, very hard. <laughs> if you're thinking... <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes happens, yeah. We caught you there. Um, if you're thinking, you're analyzing. And analyzing is paralyzing. Sure. So, so the challenge is that you secure the status quo by analyzing and leading to paralysis. Analysis paralysis. Yeah, right. And this is an illness, I even think, in society today. We, everything needs to be analyzed. And when you've analyzed it, you need someone who certifies that what you analyzed was the right thing. And even the persons who certified, they have a certificate that they're the ones who know how to certify. And so we have built a structure of logic around our society, which is analysis paralysis. And that is one of the reasons why with paralysis, of course, there's no more flow. And if there is no more flow, can't get rid of your garbage. Because the only way to get the garbage out is to create an exit, to create a passage. You know, I can add a little bit here. Analysis paralyzes only if you don't have facts in your thinking machine. If you have facts, it cannot paralyze you. But that garbage, what we have in thinking process, it can easily make paralysis. Because facts, facts, facts are facts. No one can deny them. Only believing can deny them, right? Or some stupid persons, <laughs> right? But if you have very good bunch of facts you, and you are able logically operate with them, you can make incredible discoveries. If they are connected to the back or translated back to the reality. Because thinking process or talking process, it's, like I said, it's artificial. It, it helping us just informationally and nothing more because thoughts cannot do that not, cannot do nothing right but how do you distinguish the facts and how do you decide what to unlearn and what not to unlearn say the the people learn that the earth is not flat do they then have to unlearn it and you know give room to the thought that maybe it's still flat or how does that go i think you're too logical for sure. <laughs> because the process is not linear. The process is, of course, chaotic. You know, you can't have, oh, I know this is not true anymore, now I change. No. It's a chaotic process. And fortunately, there is chaos. Because if it were in chaos, you couldn't have the iteration of not one factor versus another fact. 
because in life there are thousands of facts, you know, and you're continuously iterating. So it's a process, and that's why I use the word analysis paralysis. I really insist on that because uh, if you if you start having the facts, and you, I mean, you don't need analysis anymore because facts are facts. You don't need to analyze them. The facts are like a ping pong ball, the pinball wizard. Poof! It kicks the other one away, and it's on. And the problem is exactly the attempt to rationalize it. Because if you bring too much rationale in it, then you have for and against. And then you, you have to make a decision for and against. And this is one of the illnesses of society. Another one of the illnesses of society today is we polarize everything. It's yes and it's no. It's for and against. It's Republican or Democrat. You know, it's one of the two. Well, and there is no more space in between and it's exactly that space that gives the energy. Look at what's happening with uh, atoms and molecules. It's the space in between that makes the difference. It's not the, the, the little atom itself. It's the space in between and the energies that flow there. That sounds very much like your, your teaching. Yeah, something like, uh, yeah, similar, but uh, about facts, you know. Um, facts are some kind of uh, the result of some discovery because we cannot find facts even if we don't make some discovery we're not talking about wikipedia no 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 okay. no no <laughs> no 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 about uh, i'm talking always about uh, reality reality not uh, my facts your facts no fact is for you fact for me fact for him too right we, fact is something what is un, undeniable it just nature although the, there's a saying that one man's fact is another man's opinion no those are not facts those are those are garbage Agreed. the opinions are garbage actually and facts are real thing in the nature what was before us here right so and if we working with something and we can, or we find that fact, it's become fact. And if you can describe it by thoughts or by, by, by speaking to show it to the other, and that other person can go through the same pattern to find the fact, it's become fact for, for him too, right? No, no, not because that person believe it, but by understanding, by, by seeing, it's become fact. It's like truth become exposed. This is fact for me. But other opinions or uh, describings, I think we have in our head full of that trash, this kind of trash. It's, it's covering everything, right? What, is, what would be good, you know? We can actually check out all, all our, our thoughts one by one. Are they truthful? or not. If, that, it, if it's not truth, you can just throw it out. It would be very good, uh, some kind of a cleaning of our information, what we have in our memory. It would be good, right? Then we become more practical, because life is absolutely practical. Absolutely practical. We don't need to make some agreement, uh, do you believe me or I believe you, you know? It just become very practical life, or life, it's practical, it's become, we become with life, you know? We, we're stepping in same rhythm with life. And it's, uh, from perspective of innovation, it's very, very important, actually, to discover things, new things, which are not hidden. It means we cannot see them before we don't start to use facts which one describing reality. So here is a, a very important contribution to recognizing facts. And that's the surprise. We need to have the surprise effect. And surprise, 
as we know, is very important in the psychology of a human being. I mean, birthday parties is all about surprises. I mean, uh, Christmas gifts, surprises. I mean, we, we, we are very happy to be surprised. And we like the surprises that are well organized. And I think when we are receiving new facts, if they're received with the spirit of surprise, they have a very warm reception. If they are received with the spirit of, I don't trust, I don't believe, I don't think, and so on. So this is why in education, or at any age, it's so important to keep up that spirit of surprise, because it's the welcoming of the facts that are actually throwing out the garbage and showing you what is not true. But the, the psychology of that, ah, you know, in German they have this wonderful word. It's called the aha erlebnis. It's the aha, yeah, that's a sweet accent, aha. You know, you, you, aha, wow, you know, it, it, it shows that you are predisposed to receiving. And, and I think that is something we have to teach children because they are so full of garbage from whatever they saw, be it the Netflixes or the video games, that what, whatever they need to have is, is this predisposition to be happy and surprised. It sounds to me that you're emphasizing the emotional component of learning Whereas, uh, surprise is surprise if it's a bunch of emotions that yeah. I leave up to you to describe and to invert the comment. Yeah, that's right. Um, because he will, of course, have strong opinions about that. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I'm looking process. You describe describing process. I'm looking how it actually happens. First, to discover it. Wow! You first you can you you become aware of it. Then wow coming. It's after it. So what you're saying is, is the emotion is not necessarily needed no. for learning? No. I think uh -huh. surprise helps a lot. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. We're talking, you know, uh, how I say, we're talking uh, from di different perspectives. Yeah. If you um, are making or you already made uh, your books for children, right? Uh, they have very good purpose. and. It's like spread at, I don't know how much today, but um, they, those books helps to re receive those ahas, right? Yeah, but I'm working a little bit in different field. Different field means uh, um, I, I uh, teach practical facts about humans, right? And uh, I just help them understand uh, what actually happens within. There's many ahas too, right? But it follows discovery, understanding. For example, you are not what you think. You are not what you feel. You are not what you hear or see. And if person get it, aha. Aha coming too, but after discovery. Yeah. Just the same process that something to, to, to find something new is always aha. Uh -huh, yeah. It's small or bigger. For example, if uh, you talked about psychology, some can understand, oh, I'm not guilt. But it felt before. Twenty years, thirty years. It's not wasn't my fault, you know. Aha. Uh -huh. It's become bigger relaxing, relaxing right? Yeah. That aha is, yeah, it's good. It's good. It's always good. And I think uh, how to make aha, that is important. So we're talking about innovations. True. And in the framework of innovations, when you, you see very, very well today that there are a lot of innovations that are considered by a large majority of people as innovations, which are absolutely no innovations at all. Uh, their commercial interests, which are successful, you know, that's something very different. Um, I mean, to me, batteries is one of those. I mean, any child in studying a little bit of physics will figure out that the energy embedded in in hydrogen molecules is a multiple of what you could ever press into 
uh, a molten battery uh, that needed uh, open pit mines and a uh, lot of smelting. And, and it doesn't take really a big genius to say, oh, but, you know, <laughs> where, where are the facts? Uh, the facts are that one is a commercial interest and the other one is a, physic, a reality of physics. I mean, there's, that is the lightest uh, atom that we have. So I, I believe that when we talk about innovations, we're stuck with a lot of not even discoveries. I mean, it's a step lower. It's pure commercial interests. You know, sure, sure. Yeah. that are being pushed and very beautifully uh, packaged as being the solution to a problem in the world. And there are even patents given on that. But patents is nothing about innovations. That is just a protection so that you can operate. Um, so to me, it's very key in the, in, in the work that I try to do to accelerate innovations for the common good because we have to differentiate ourselves from the other innovations. And the innovations for the common good is basically the discovery of what nature is all about. Right. And internalize it in our day-to-day -day society <laughs> and communities. Because only when we internalize it and we welcomed it and we use it and we do it, that's when we were making a difference for everyone. I am agree to you. You know, uh, I looked at the term of innovation. And it's actually part of uh, business. It's all the term is always connected to the business, right? It means uh, basically uh, it's already divided where where it can happen, and if uh, it can happen with some kind of uh, commercial or, or economical uh, conditions, if some conditions need to be changed or something. But uh, my field is human. To make innovation here, actually it's not something new because uh, uh, we have emotions, we have thoughts, we have consciousness, uh, seven properties of consciousness, we have true self, we have, we have body. But uh, they are quite common things. We're using those things what we don't know it. And innovation means to be known, to be, to be teached or, or taught, to know those things and start to use them properly. And that the changes what actually happens, they are amazing actually. We start to know we are not just flesh and bones, we are something more and we can do so many things which are incredible. Why I'm looking uh, humans? Because uh, uh, I was always curious about myself. What happens with me? Uh, why those emotions? What consciousness? Some strange states, experiences. Why it happens to me? I never was uh, agree with brain theory, only brain theory. And going deeper, and I start to discover those things. But why I'm talking about it? Because look, looks. Everything what happens with humans and uh, between relationship, humans, nature. We know we're destroying nature, just like uh, cancer, right? It starts from humans, not from nature. It means if we don't make innovation with us, we can uh, destroy not only nature, but ourselves too, right? That's the that reason why, why I'm so, so passionate about uh, innovation with us, with humans, to start in, uh, that inner change, to make changes outside us, in the nature. For example, that um, uh, atom about other told, right? How to make the, those batteries from it. It depends, right? Because uh, I think that uh, technology exists already and many others, but they are hidden because they are not supported by business. But why they are not supported by business? Because that inner, inner world of them have some kind of ideas, believings to keep those things there. 
It means they believe this, these opinions as very, very important. They're like truth to them because they believe it. But if even those people can make innovation within, they can lose those opinions to become more humanic, more humans, to bring those incredible innovations or, uh, or uh, patterns or technologies from nature to use of everyone. I, I wrote a fable uh, last year, which, is, uh, which has the title, How Can Humans Be More Humane? You know, because we have gotten this wonderful term, we're human, but we're not humane. We forgot the little detail. And what I suge would suggest to uh, Ingmar is that the innovations that you look at on the inner have to be at the same time, at the same time, at societal level, be accompanied with innovations from nature. Because before you have done your job, with all those who are not permitting to happen, we have to get on the road already. And so I think the, the, the innovations we talk about is, is the inner innovation, but we also need to innovate all the stuff that we have around us, uh, because we are the cancer. I mean, <laughs> nature can perfectly continue without us. True. Um, but we can't continue. And, and this is where we have now for 50 years. I mean, can you imagine it's 2022? And 50 years ago, the Club of Rome said limits to growth. No globalization. No single focus on one product. No, and, we, we, and then the hippies came and said, no, we don't want it. And somehow, it happened anyway. So... It's clear that there was no consciousness, even there was awareness. And I think this is, again, very important in your work, is that being aware doesn't mean that you're changing. Um, and the awareness is where we have all the time more facts about an, the, the reality around us, and we have the awareness of the facts, and we still don't change the way we behave. And I think that's why it's so important in society to have these unconditional uh, change agents. I mean, maybe they were called missionaries uh, in, in an old church context, but they were people who just could not be corrupted. You know, they had a mission. And, and to me, it's very important because it's like uh, the, the dynamics of millions of bacteria where in the end only one will mutate. But that mutation of that one will change everything. And the liberty that we need in societies and communities to have the free operators, the free wheelers, you know, to be able to be the vectors and the change agents, um, because they have at the core what I call the ethics. And the ethics is to really be simple with everything and have the commons as the center. Mm. You know, there was a beautiful article written that you, some of those who study economics, uh, discover after they finish their studies. And it's called The Tragedy of the Commons. It was written right after the famous book, The Wealth of Nations, was written. Um, and, and all of a sudden we realized some people realized that this invisible hand <laughs> was not that invisible at all. Actually, it was quite clear that the tragedy of the commons was that everyone was working for their own personal interests. Sure. And it was not self-organizing that it was being imposed. <clears throat> now, that was written already in 1794. Mm -hmm. So it's not 50 years ago. It is 230 years ago. And this is where I've been struggling with the awareness. Things have been said, things have been explained, things have been comprehended, 
but it didn't rise up to consciousness. It stayed flat. Looks like um, our works can hold that in English. Um, they're supporting each other. Symbiotic. Symbiotic, right? Not supporting. Symbiotic. Supporting is to yeah. It's better, much more better word. Very good. But I think we're in, indeed, you know, the, the wise men have been around for thousands of years talking about consciousness and, and the value in it, yet we don't see a fully conscious society. I think you're not right. Wise men don't talk with stupid people. Because stupid people cannot understand wise men. Mm. And uh, stupid people taking too much time away, you know. That's the reason why I think that old wise men, they served only kings, for example, or someone who was very important. They don't talk with others because it's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. but just to be today, sure. today, I think the uh, situation is much more better. Mm -hmm. but just to understand where each of you stand, you know, let's say on a scale where one end is labeled, we are all doomed, there's nothing to be done anymore, it's too late. And the other end says, you know, there is still hope with, uh, you know, we come together with the consciousness, with the science, we can make it work. You know, where, where do you place us? <coughs> you know, if I'm looking, for example, uh, innovation, uh, a Gunther work, for example, or what I am doing, right? It's always in the right time. If looking at pattern of evolution, just bringing those, kind, those guys here, right? Not only us, but maybe thousands more, right? Everything is fixed, actually, by law, by facts. But they are so big, so huge processes, we cannot actually maybe understand uh, deeply uh, what are those processes. But they are still here. We are. This is not consequence. We are consequence. We are here. It's clear reason, because uh, I don't know how your uh, experience, but my experience can say life is. Uh, Absolutely, one hundred percent practical. It's everything what happens have reason. Have everything is processes. We cannot live without processes actually, because it's not possible. Everything is like more like me mechanical, but that mechanics is uh, it's so deep, you know. We we cannot believe this. It's mechanical, but it is. I would like you to change your your scale. I'm not happy to be on a scale between disaster and hope. I mean, I think we can go beyond hope today, mm -hmm. way beyond hope. And if you limit the scale just to is there hope, yes or no, I mean, no, I mean, come on, there's much more than hope. And when it comes to the, the wise man, you know, everyone is wise. Everyone is wise. It's, just, it's not the privilege of a few. There is a lot of wisdom. But are we allowing the wisdom to emerge or not? Or are we submerging the wisdom in the garbage? You know? And unfortunately, too many people never get to their innate wisdom. And, and, and that is one of the crises we're living in, is that we don't permit our innate wisdom to emerge. And that means... You don't give hope a chance. You know, my, my daughter created uh, a foundation that was called the future of hope. You know, not hope, the future of hope. And we need to nurture the fact that there's a lot of future for hope because we're already beyond the hope question. Of course, because if you're stuck there, <laughs> you're not getting anywhere. You can as well give up. You know, and have a good glass of champagne and have a good last party and move. See, this is not where society has to go to. We have to go to a society where the scale is not doom or hope. Mm -hmm. It is doom and the future of hope. Yeah. Maybe about stupid people, you know, it's more, more like ignorance. Because it's always uh, knowledge or uh, factual knowledge versus believing. It's always like that. 
even if wise men can spread something, I think we both know if you're spreading some kind of uh, facts which want to become very useful to many, many people, you always can find the people who don't believe it because they have some another idea about it. They even don't go deeper to understand what was said for them. They just deny it because they believe automatically something different. I think this is biggest obstacle for innovation. Wonderful that you say that, uh, Ingvar, because just uh, I think a week ago, I wrote a little tweet, one of the one-liners, and said, uh, the, the biggest enemy we have is our own ignorance. Sure. It's even an enemy. If you don't recognize that you are ignorant, you just not giving a chance to have an aha effect, you're not giving a chance to yourself, then you are, you are suffering and, and, and it will be tough. So ignorance is indeed, in my view as well, a very, very important obstacle and you can't innovate when you don't know. Actually, you know how interesting it is. If um, you're ignorant, but still you live your life, you're using ingredients which are making life, and ignorance can, can combine those things in your life which want making sufferings to you. But if you are wise, it means you know, you now know reality. You combine same things differently without sufferings. It looks very logical, actually. So how ignorant is society today? I mean, that would be a scale where I would uh, say how ignorant society and how, how many facts have really been embraced by society. And there I think we're, we're, we're down here. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, we have this future of hope, so we can put it uh, into a perspective. Not an equilibrium, because I don't want equilibrium. Yeah. I want perspective. Okay, let us continue on that in a, in a, in a minute. But, but you know, uh, can I add a little bit about yeah, sure. future? You know, of course people have hope in the future, right? But if you're looking more closer, you will see we don't have future. It's fact too. Future is in our head. This is imagination about things in the future. But actually we are here and now only. We even don't have past. If you're asking, you remember something from past, uh, some, sometimes it's very painful, right? And you're asking, when do I thinking? Answer is only now, always now. If, you, if I hope to the future, I'm imagining some things become better and asking for myself, when am I doing it now? Then you can ask, do you, do uh, uh, how that in English? Uh, uh, do I am, do am I something not now? It was right English on that. Pretty much, yeah. Am I doing something that which is not right now? Yeah. Answer is always always one, only now. This is innovation, isn't? Because uh, you're looking, wow, past. Don't, it doesn't exist. Future doesn't exist, it's only now. It's very good news, it's very good aha, isn't? Because now I know whatever things I do, I do now. I can continue with my, my life processes to create them here. That's here, here on my hands, right? Isn't good news? <laughs> but that bit put you out of business? <laughs> no, I'm not worried about business. Uh, you know infinity. Mm -hmm. Very well. Past, present, or for you, present, past. No. Present, present. And, and, sorry, past and future. And, and there is a crossing, and that's the present. So what we've been saying is that little present has to become a bit bigger. And as 
instead of this, you can see it, it has to be this. You know, sorry, but this is wrong interpretation. I'm glad we disagree on something. <laughs> Let's be, let me make time, some, eh? <laughs> something better here. You know, everything happens practically in present, here and now. This is that point in the middle, crossing point. But then if I st start to look my my memory, then I'm doing this and making one line. Then I using my memory to project it to the future, then I'm making the second one. And you have sign of eternity. Looking past, looking future, making two things, and all of them starts from point. Yes, now the question is, is that point a millisecond? Is that an hour? I is know that... answer, I know answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think with this we can take a break. <laughs> no, let, me, let me give you answer. It's actually, let me ask you, how long is present? It's already gone by asking it. How long is present, not things which don't exist in the present? present how long is here and now? It's all the time because it's one after the other. Right, it's all the time. It actually means it's eternal. It's always one unchangeable but what it means it's timeless present is timeless and you know what is aha uh -huh, that timeless present is our consciousness and things lives in it and we're measuring time or using time to measure things things what or different processes, it happens between things. But if we can connect to the present itself, it's timeless. And if you have timeless consciousness, you know, it's uh, actually um, a base for uh, innovation. It's consciousness, right? With consciousness properties. Then you become objective uh, to the other things. Then reality starts to appear. Let's start to understand. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's game or not? <laughs> Very good. I'd like to maybe remind here for our viewers that you are most welcome to to uh, pitch in your questions as well. Should you have any? Just if you're in the audience here, raise your hand, or if you're in the Zoom, just put your question in the in the chat there, and it will come magically to my screen here. But we have one question there. Uh, you can ask either in Estonian or in, or in English. English. So. Well, it doesn't matter. I speak both. Right. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, question to um, Mr. Vilvido. Uh, could you bring some examples of facts, just to make it clear? You talk about facts, but bring, I don't know, a couple of facts to the facts. Thank you. Quite simple facts. For example, we're breeding. It, it, it actually happens, right? We can recognize it. We have heartbeat, it happens. We existing, everyone knows. If I'm asking you, do, are you, do you exist? Everyone say, yes, I am. For example, the, I'm talking about facts, right? For example, can you notice something? Can you recognize something? Answer is, yes. Is it fact or not? For example, if uh, I'm asking, you are thinking, you can feel emotions, you can hear sounds, you can taste smell, tastes, and, or, and uh, sensations, right? Who is the one who can recognize all those things? You or not you? This question. Then you can discover that fact. It was clear in English or not? I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't? Okay. 
<laughs> Please, let, let's make it a little bit uh, vo uh, longer, right? Listen some sounds in this room. And let me ask you, do you listen it? Do you hear it? And recognize who are you who can hear it? Is it your thoughts, emotions, or you? True self. Then you can feel something. This is a very practical example because you cannot find the facts without a practical part to become believing. Can you feel your body, for example? Then I ask, I'm, I'm, I'm asking uh, who can recognize it? What do you feel? Your emotions, thoughts, or you? Its answer is always one. It's fact of your existence. It's very important. So, uh, if I may clarify all those examples, you're talking about uh, sensations, well, smells and all this. And uh, with those examples, you're saying that the only fact is fact of me, not the smell or, you know, hearing something because we smell differently, we hear differently. It's not a fact. I'm not talking about uh, differences. This example was uh, created uh, to understand who are you, true self. Of course, we can smell different uh, smells and, and people can, can even smell the same smell differently. It's, it's okay, but that's not the question. It's not, uh, not, uh, not, not part of discovery. My question was, who is that one who can recognize sounds, smells, tastes, feelings? Maybe it was too short, but you can practice it at home to try to figure out answer. It's not actually figuring out in simple way, it's real figuring out. For example, uh, you know, people thinking, always thinking. Let me ask one question. It goes to the same, same direction, right? Same experience or same aha uh -huh, maybe coming. Do your thinking. It was question. question. Sometimes. Okay, sometimes. If you're thinking, can you recognize your thoughts? Sometimes. Who is that who can recognize you have thoughts? Now you can, uh, that's, I'm guiding you, no? But if you, if you can understand practically, oh, here's someone who can recognize my thoughts. It's actually fact for everyone, for, for, for all humans, not only for you. Then you can feel yourself and you can find yourself, true self. But this is, uh, what is not fact here? For example, we're thinking and it feels, this is me, our thoughts making us. Because thoughts always talking with me. Me is always there. But we cannot understand. We are readers or listeners of our thoughts. That's real me, which one never talks. It's always in the silence. Thoughts are objects for us. Logic said we cannot read even our thoughts if you are not separated from them. We need to be separated. If you become experienced of your thoughts, you cannot read thoughts because you are not separated anymore. We cannot feel emotions, for example, if we, we are not separated from them. It always need to be distance. That's the reason why we say exist 
one absolute fact. It's strongly said, but exists only one subject and eternal objects around it. And you can be experienced experience of whatever objects around. But that's the main problem of uh, humankind. We're always experiencing something and we don't know who we are. It's absolutely a practical question. Very innovative, actually. <laughs> Let me take the same breathing example okay. of Ingvar and, and interpret it into my search for innovations. Because breathing is a miraculous process. I mean, it is really incredible because in the end of the day, I have 500 million little sponges in my lungs and they're connected to a couple billion capillaries that carry blood. And somehow these sponges only take out CO2. Wow. And I do wow. And there goes my CO2. It was in the liquid and it goes out. That's a fact. I mean, don't debate it. I mean, there's no need to debate it. It's it. And then the second thing is that it takes oxygen out of the air and boom, puts it in into the blood. Isn't this, isn't this an incredible fact? I it mean, is. I, I think now to me comes innovation because our subject is innovation. Now comes the innovation saying these are billions of capillaries, small, tiny, tiny little veins. And it's been working for millions of years. We didn't invent it. <laughs> it's no invention. Thanks whatsoever. God. I mean, it, it's, it's operating <laughs> and it is kind of foul proof because when, when you lose a lung, you still stay alive. I mean, it's over designed because even if you have great trouble with your lungs, with little pieces, you stay alive. So I'm asking myself, how come that everything in industry is with big pipes and big pumps? And in my body, which is a proof of an extraordinary way of managing liquids, blending, taking things out, etc., it, it operates without a pump. And somehow the law of friction doesn't seem to be applying. Oh, that's very interesting. Aha. Uh -huh. You know, aha. Uh -huh. Surprise, surprise. So what am I going to do with this? Well... One of my innovations that I work on today, it's not me personally, but I have co-invented, co-discovered co it, co-discovered it, is that we can have water run through this. It's not big pipes, it's tiny pipes. And we can take, not now the CO2 out, but I can take the nanoplastics out. Oh, that's a contribution to humanity because we have made, we can correct the errors of the past. So that's why I'm looking at my affinity. We may say that's the past, that's the future, but I'm saying, <laughs> but there is an error of the past which is affecting us today, and maybe even for eternity, if we don't do anything, and then we carry that baggage <coughs> with us forever. So to me, the breathing example of Ingvar gives me a deeper look on what we said before, the patterns. How, what's the pattern of this? And the pattern, let's start recognizing. I'm sorry I'm not looking at you because the light is so bright. And then, I'm, and then I need to do like this. But the, the, the beauty is when I start recognizing the patterns, one of those recognitions is small pipes, uh, not big pipes. And of course, then I'm questioning myself, how are they being made? And then I find out that there is no 3D printer in the world today that can make the capillaries as we're using them in our lungs. So innovation, I need new 3D printers. Let's and, do it. And, 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 so, and it's obvious because someone has been making it already. By the print it, printing it. Yeah. So this is how I go through the process of innovation by looking at something very simple as breathing. And you come to an understanding, but once you get into it, and this is the beauty, I believe, in this connected thinking, 
Uh, it's a domino effect because one wrong thought after the other is falling down. I mean, wow, we were thinking that 3D printers were so marvelous, and I'm coming to the conclusion that they're so backwards. I mean, we really have to go a long way before we get to the 3D printing of what we need. Because if we really want to take the dirty things out of our environment, we need to take the nanoparticles out, the size of the CO2 in our lungs. And we are not equipped for that. So now I can target innovations. And then you become much more proactive. That's why I say there is a future for hope. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. once you start seeing this, you say, 3D printers, we have to innovate the 3D printers. Because what we have now can never do the job as we know works. The fact is, it works. And if anyone has a doubt, <laughs> there are 8 billion people running around the world, and they are about, uh, well, we think, you know, 100 billion living species that have lungs and that do somehow the same function. This is where we go <clears throat> in, in, in what I call innovation. You know, that's interesting. Your example was so good, white and uh, practical. But if I'm asking, you know, one fact, for example, are you thinking? Yes, I'm thinking. It's in fact. But it's fact. But it's so common. For example, can you suppress your emotions? Yes, of course I can. Isn't miracle? Isn't? It's so common, you know. You can recognize something. You're looking. Your your uh, awareness is somewhere, and you can recognize those things. Isn't miracle? It's fact. You can divide at the same time. You can recognize practical, uh, practically everything, inside, outside, visible, invisible things, thoughts are invisible, emotions are invisible, right? Isn't those miracles too? But we are used to those things. They are too common for us. But big secrets are hidden in those processes. That's the reason why they don't make for us. Uh-huh. Even for, from thoughts are described everything what we know. But if we don't think anymore, for example, we have amnesia, we don't remember nothing, then it becomes strange. Then that fact with thinking becomes very important. So I'm working with simple common things, making innovation with them to show, to point, they are not so simple things, how they look for us. They are much more deeper, much more important in our life. Right? But here we come to what, I, what we call pattern recognition. So if I understand my breathing, then the same pattern is giving me the fact that uh, coconuts are full of water and no one is pumping them. It's the same logic. Absolutely. Is it, it, it's the same fact. Yes. And so I don't need to have a new fact-finding mission. It's the same fact. And mm -hmm. it's the same fact that explains how an apple gets up in a tree and how I don't have to worry about the law of gravity. Because it's the same pattern. It's tiny little pipes that are connecting everything and secure flows without pumps. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm taking a step back and saying, without pumps, ladies and gentlemen, 10% of the world's consumption of energy is for pumping things around. I mean, haven't we realized that everything works without pumps, and all of a sudden, we are depending on pumps to make our economy work. So, this comes to something we have discussed before, uh, Ingvar, and that is, how can I stimulate now the innovation? And the stimuli for the innovation is to imagine something with nothing. So I'm saying, how can we move liquids around without pumps? Eliminate the pump because it is very clear that there's no apple being pumped up in a tree, there's no coconut water getting into the coconut, and there's no CO2 being taken out with pumps. So why do we take it as our fact, truth, that the economy can't work without pumps? And therefore, 
companies that produce pumps are considered very strategic in the world. Whereas I'm saying they're the problem. And that's part of the garbage we have to get out. I, I wonder if, is this as practical enough? It is practical, but I have a lot of facts, <laughs> but it's not practical. So this is about creating something by eliminating some of the known factors. Exactly. And Ingvar, would you agree with that view? And, and, or what are, in your opinion, the properties one would need to develop in order to promote I'm absolutely innovation? agree with uh, Gunther. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, uh, how do I say? I, I'm practically minded, like engineer-minded person, you know, and uh, I'm always looking what happens, really happens, by observing, and always uh, uh, eliminating something, you know, and... Uh, it's like the, it's main reason for questions. What is there? What is more? Or how those things are connected to each other? Or what is unknown here, hidden? Or how things can work without this ingredient? How they work or they cannot work? It's always like a, it's like my 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 table. You know, it's always like. Same, same look, you know. But guys, does nature innovate? Or is it only when we take the results of evolution and put them to good use for mankind that we can call it innovation? Oh, no, nature is always innovating. Surprisingly, I mean, even with artifacts, not just conceptually and not only through evolution. I mean, uh, I, I give you a very nice example. You know, they're crickets. You know, you know the crickets, and they make a chirping noise. Right. Yeah. And for some, this is music, and for some, this is really a disturbance. You know, I, I, I'm the one who thinks this is music. And, and actually, the size of the cricket determines the volume of the sounds that comes out. It's normal because it's it's a string that it's rubbing, and so if you have a bigger string and a big leg, then he can rub more. But then there are some crickets who feel it's really unfair that the ladies only go to the man with the biggest noise. So they make megaphones. Mm -hmm. They make a megaphone. Actually, they cut a hole out of a little leaf and they attach it to them and they have a megaphone. And all of a sudden, they have innovated their status in community by having a megaphone. Now, that level of of capacity to understand that I need to do something about my role in society was thought to be a fact for chimpanzees, you know, primates, but not for crickets. And we start recognizing that actually just about every living species at some point in time is bringing innovations forward and is innovating in a way that surprises us. Now, I always ask the question, why didn't we see it? Ignorance. Mm -hmm. Because our, 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 our human-centered ego never made us look at a cricket for megaphones. Right. But now that we know that crickets have megaphones, you know, we can start looking for a few other animals that are actually using artifacts in order to achieve a goal. And, and that is an innovation. That's not evolution. That is an innovation. Megaphones at the size of a cricket like that. And, and you know, it's, it's a fascinating innovation. And it serves a common purpose. Because what happens is that now the genetic pool is not only about size. Which is very important. Because if the genetic pool of crickets is only about size, they will lead to oversize and demise. Because we know in nature that everything that starts going oversize, see the dinosaurs, actually demise. <coughs> and so there is a kind of a defense mechanism that has been developed in order to preserve the richness of the genetic pool, have megaphones. Yeah, the things that males do to get laid. <laughs> but, uh, but look, you, uh, it's actually a fact. Today, antibiotics doesn't work anymore properly. Because uh, bacteria uh, res have resistance, right? Is it innovation or evolution of bacteria? No. 
the bacteria is a, is a real evolutionary pressure. For me, the, the fact that uh, so many bacteria and viruses are developing absolute resistance to the medications that we have developed is an evolutionary pressure. Um, it is when there is a leap forward, you know. Um, the leap forward is when the bacteria now start making their own, their own, uh, their own antibiotics. But if we say this is uh, not the process of evolution, it's process of of what? of the human being. Can it be a process of... Uh, how Ignorance? It? No, 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 no. I mean, uh, can be bacteria able to improvise? They're all the time. Maybe this is innovation too. But bacteria, one of the magic things of bacteria is that individually they're not very important. But they have, you know, bacteria talk to each other. Yes, of course. Uh, of course. They have a very intense language. Uh, and when they find bacteria of the same type, they start creating what is called a biofilm, a film. And the film will automatically create a super structure and a super being. That's why the danger is that antibiotics don't work anymore on biofilms. Even I heard, you know, our DNA talks. Everything DNA talks, talks too. Everything talks. Yes. But is this part of evolution or innovation? It's a question of terms and only, right? Or not? For me, innovation is when you leapfrog and you step outside the existing parameters of the pattern. So then you leapfrog. So what is happening, for example, is that now you have bacteria making their own antibiotics because they saw, oh, that's what antibiotics can do. Now I'm going to make antibiotics sure. for me. Right. And that, for me, is an innovation. Actually, innovation. Because they never did that before. It's completely yes, new. Absolutely. You are right. But and from whom means? did they learn it? Well, from the guy who was trying to kill him. Right. Oh, this is right. smart, huh? It I is. Mean, it, it looks very smart, right? <laughs> Actually, it means uh, innovation is everywhere. All the time. Let's change the word evolution to the innovation. That, that would be innovation too. Innolution. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Guys, let's take a couple of viewer questions as well. Otherwise, we are running out of time and there are quite a few here. So if I can maybe ask you to be as brief as you can, while still being comprehensive, <laughs> if that's possible. <laughs> um, a human's task in life, question mark, is it to serve as many as possible, to create or produce something new? And if you can, please bring practical examples. The first one you must serve is yourself. I mean, you can't serve everyone without taking care of yourself. So I think this is very important. Uh, you cannot neglect the me. And when the me is in order, you will be much more effective in taking care of the others. You know, um, I say, uh, by words of uh, Siddhas. Siddhas was ancient scientists, which are discovering actually everything. And uh, they, they established yoga system, which are known. And, uh, and they're discovering, uh, discovering uh, geometry, mathematics, and other things that came from those guys, you know. They said I got, I, about humans, very simple way. They said, first task is to find who you are really, who you are. Second, they said, learn. Learn what really happens. Learn from nature. 
and if you if you can uh, fit all of those to only two parts then it can be very useful not only for self but for others too So the next question about learning, and I know this is close to both of your hearts, so <laughs> see how to teach innovation at schools. Don't teach it, do it. Can you elaborate? Well, I thought I was going to be trying to be very <laughs> concise because, um, you, you know, you can't teach innovation. It has to be a way of life. It has to show by what you're doing in class. You know, it, it has to be so obvious, the process, that it is by doing. I mean, today I had to, this privilege of being together with a group of teachers from a, a new school in Rakvire. And, and, you know, I said, the most important thing you, you have before you is do it. Don't think about it, do it. Because once you do it, you will change the culture of embracing innovations and doing things differently. And, you know, a child is ready to play and ready to actually embrace very well. So to me, you can't teach. You have to do. Mm -hmm. And by doing, you're teaching. For me, it's, it's a little bit different. You can teach, you can learn how to become uh, free from garbage. But actually, uh, we have approximately 90% of garbage in our mind, in our head. Then your consciousness becomes exposed. It's coming out. Because consciousness is an uh, unnecessary tool, thing, to make innovation. Without consciousness, you cannot do it. Then you can de develop uh, properties of consciousness, seven properties, awareness, um, dividing, then uh, deepening process, then uh, understanding, insight, intuition and inspiration. All those qualities exist without thinking and emotional uh, sensations. They are actually happens in silence. If a person learns how to throw out garbage and develop those qualities, it's become naturally very, very innovative. Mm -hmm. But this is, uh, sorry, you cannot uh, learn it just by a few hours in the week, right? You need to work with it hard, quite hard, you know, because that uh, trash is full of knowledge, which one doesn't work. And quite a long, long period, but uh, you can become permanently innovative person mm -hmm. in very stable mode. But would there, would there be a way to eliminate the trash in the first place? Because it seems a very ineffective process to first learn and then unlearn, to first you know, pull the garbage in and then push it out. You know, don't be too linear. You know, it's not one and then the other. It's a lot of things at the same time. And, and to me, the doing is very important because children when they're doing, they will do it with their hands, they will do it with their eyes, and not just with words and exams. And it's very important that they have it in their fingers, they have it on their feet. I mean, today we had some extraordinary proposals from the teachers on how to approach the children, and, and I was each time pushing them a little bit further, you know. For, for example, when, when you want to give the children the experience of living in the Arctic Circle with the Samis, I said, start by making a sleeping bag from a reindeer skin. Practical, do it. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to learn how to sew a reindeer skin together, the first thing you need to know is how to use a knife to get this, the, the hairs off. And, and that will be a knife that most of your parents won't like you to have in your hands because it's a very sharp knife. So this is what I mean with being practical, you know. Yes, the idea to the Arctic Circle is a life experience, but making a sleeping bag, that is teaching you weaving, that teaches you knives, that teaches you warmth, that teaches you a lot of other things, which then, of course, for you become a fact of life. I mean, there's no questioning about it anymore. And no one will say, oh, but uh, 
you have to have this special, you know, this special fleece jacket made from this high technology fiber, which of course created massive microplastics, but that's another issue. This is where I want to go to. It's very practical. Do it. Okay. It's, it's actually always very practical, but this is quite simple uh, explanation to understand what it is. But our life is very, very complicated. Actually, it's full of things. We can use uh, those knowledges practically in whatever level of our life, right? Not only there, but even to create uh, something here inside without skin, right? Mm -hmm. so very, very wide, actually, wide range, where we can be very innovative. All right, back to viewer questions. Um, without memory, we can't know what we have done to have the results in the present so that I can learn and do a different choice. And without imagination, I can't see future potential. So I guess this is a question about you know, the present, the past and the future. You know, uh, I can talk about my experience. I am here now always because I'm used to be here, right? And the uh, past doesn't bother me, future doesn't bother me because they're coming from memory, automized memory. I don't use my memory to be my guide. I'm guided by my consciousness about, uh, how is it, like that warm, you know? Like as I got told before, how, how when if American Indians learn things, how that happens. For me, it's common. It's always here with everything what I'm doing. Because memory is good, but look, memory always a repetition. Future, which are created, is created by past, with all mistakes and other things. But if you are here and now, you cannot make those mistakes, which are not uh, made by memory. Right? You can make mistakes only because you are ignorant to something. But this is unknowing, that real knowing. Right? So, I'm not uh, unhappy because I don't think, or remember, or imagining. I'm imaginating something if I need to create something to the future, but I know very, very exactly I can do it only now. This process that, that uh, how I say, rope is here. I'm making that rope, which I'm going to the, to the future, making it here, right? I can't be tomorrow, I can be yesterday, only here, practically. Right. Next question. Next question, yeah. <clears throat> Let's see if I can sum it up. That's quite a long one. Discovery seemed to be a, to be a play of the frontier of un, unknown in a space where I don't know what I don't know. So it gives an example of hearing the music accord, which uh, is both a, a sound and a process, which we call a harmony of different sound waves. So the question is, what is your view if we learn to understand the process of cause and manipulate with it? Is this a process on, of innovation or evolution? I don't know, actually. It's not so important. Uh, those words are not important, actually. Mm -hmm. I say always, if I, I don't know yet, mm -hmm. but it's become known after, later, Right. All right. So I'd like to touch upon maybe a bit on your experiences uh, on what what kills innovation. I imagine you've come across a thousand of bright ideas, and then in your experience, what usually is, you know, is the is the obstacle? Is it the lack of resources? Is the people's unwillingness to change, it's something else? I, I think Ingvar said it, it's ignorance. I mean, we're ignoring, or we're just ignorant about what it means and what it is. Uh, you know, I go back to the heart, because I think it's good to build on a few of the experiences. You know, 
If we ask ourselves the question, how does a heart work? Then we realize, well, I suggest that we look at the biggest heart in the world. It's easier, you can go inside and outside. It's the heart of a blue whale. And in right. the heart of a blue whale, you know, the blue whale can pump a thousand liters every time. But it does it with six volt direct current. Now, if you propose to an engineer that you're pumping a thousand liters with six volt direct current, he will say that it's bad, this doesn't exist. However, the, the whale has an aorta that is uh, 50 centimeters wide. It, it does need a pump at that stage. And, and then the question is, how does it make the electricity? You know, what is the... So people are so ignorant about how a heart really works that we invent the pacemaker. And, I'm, and pacemakers have saved millions of people life, but it's, it's something that is actually making the person fully dependent on an external device. Whereas I do not know any whale that needed a pacemaker. Actually, there are no whales with heart attacks. Sure. And, and the whales, their heart is sitting in fat and still it doesn't get a heart attack. So what is the difference? And the difference is distribution of electric current. The whale innovated by having uh, 70 millivolt impulses all around the heart. It's perfectly coordinated so that the, the four chambers are working in harmony as it's supposed to function. But it's a distribution. Then the question is, where does the electricity come from? Because there's no wire. There's no wire. How does it work? Well, it doesn't, it, it, we don't know how it works. Well, we know how it works now because they have kind of wires that are two cells thick of cells that are dedicated to conductivity. Mm. Oh, that's very interesting. That means that now we can have the same function as a pacemaker, giving the right impulses, but we only need to put in a little carbon fiber that is, that is two cells thick. And that will take the current from one side in the body to the other side of the body. Now, I'm not talking about long distances, I'm talking about millimeters. Because we're not connecting impulses of 6 volts, we're, in, we're doing it with 70 millivolts. You see, this discovery of how it all works, really works, allows us to be tremendously innovative. Today, and, and so because the question is about my real work, Today, we have two patients in Mayo Clinic in the United States that are operating on carbon fibers instead of pacemakers. Yeah. What does it mean? It means you don't have to open the chest anymore. It means you don't need a battery anymore. It means you can, just with a catheter, place it where you, where you see on your screen, there is a little lack of electric power there. And there you just uh, connect, it. connect plug, in. Uh, plug in a little wire that is two cells thick. Now, we can't make wires that are two cells thick today. We can't do we, it. We, we, need, need we need big wires for the time being. So, again, I see a pathway for innovation. Who is the obstacle? Well, I'm sorry to say, but uh, placing a pacemaker in a human body is $50,000. Doing a catheter intervention into the heart is $500. Um, so I, I thought people would be very happy. Uh, and apparently some, some people are not happy. <laughs> I don't know why they're not so happy, but at any rate, um, we have succeeded that uh, two of the largest pacemaker producers in the world have now funded the placement of the no pacemaker solution. Mm -hmm. So now comes my main question. What did we need for that? Patience. A lot of patience. Because you can't force the issues. I mean, I am sometimes face to face with aggression because I'm upsetting a status quo. But I can't respond to aggression with I aggression. I can understand you. <laughs> I can't respond with more, with more aggression. We have to respond with patience. Mm -hmm. And by simply sticking to the path. So that is the reality. It's of course there is a, a problem with vested interests, ignorance, and then there are regulators who sometimes uh, 
don't know what they're regulating. This is one of the very big problems we're facing because it, certain garbage becomes institutionalized. Right. So if ignorance right. is the issue, how do we get rid of it? Yes, it is. But uh, it starts al already, you know, from, I would say, from some another or different uh, topic or, or I would say, our main problems is always ignorance, always, even if it's scientifically proved, but it's still ignorance. For example, who am I? Today is defined like you are a biological living being, right? But for you, it doesn't look like that. Your empirical experience about true self or self is different. But it's the biological human face or, or uh, this, this describing of humans are, or it's, uh, it's everywhere, everyone know it. It's established. Right, it's everyone knows. I'm looking at the mirror. I know this is me, right? And uh, this is the same problem actually. It's written down, and everything believe it. Instead, your own experience, right? Because you know why it's so important. It's one kind of lie, official lie. But that lie, putting you as human to the level of animals, Anim animals, right? If you're looking at some wars, you know, people, humans become killed like animals. No one count, count them, you know, because it's just a biological living being. But if you go deeper, you can, you find yourself, true self, you start to understand, you know, I'm absolutely different. I'm not biological body. I'm not my emotions. I'm not my thoughts even, you know. I'm something different. And what is important, in this level, you are absolute goodness. Can you imagine if uh, people can find themselves and they can understand by practical, aha, I'm good. But all those other bad things what we have as humans are from animalistic, biological life. We actually are good by nature, not by my idea, by nature, by fact. And that is a real human. But the real human need to come out from this uh, established idea who we are not. And you know how many changes start to happen. It's incredible. It's individual revolution. Okay, so maybe let's touch upon a bit on the issue of growth as well. It seems to me innovation is not always, but very often about you know, doing something better, doing something more, doing something more efficiently. It like, feels like the growth is like embedded in the human nature almost. But we know with growth always, and then when there are physical resources at play, they are limited. Is it the same with human resources? Is it inevitable that we always need to grow? Or does there come a limit to it? I say it's our animalistic part. Because mm -hmm. if you're looking at uh, animals, you will see they same doing, they, they're doing the same things, absolutely the same things. But they never take more than they need. Humans taking more more than they need, needs is. We have this funny thing that we believe in accumulation of money on bank accounts and uh, very well knowing that we cannot take it anywhere. So that is one of the factors that is uh, a known behavioral shortcoming of many people. But on the other hand, we know that there is no limit to learning. We have an unlimited capacity to learn. And it never stops until we decide it's over. But 
we have this innate capability to keep on learning. And I think, unfortunately, there is a need to debate limits because there are physical limits. But we don't take enough time to debate our unlimited capacity to learn, to love, unlimited, you know. And, and we need to really balance in our society. You know, when I listen to what children here have to hear, it's always about the problems and the limits and the walls and the negative and it's always... And we don't share this, this really wealth in the capacity to go beyond limits of love and learning. Yeah, I agree. Totally agree with it. Yeah. Like I said before, we have only two, uh, two tasks to, as humans to know who you are really and to learn. Other things just follows, you know. That's it. So in terms of learning, uh, maybe could you give an example of what you have seen of, of, of someone making a real inner innovation or a big step forward in terms of, of learning and then growing? You know, one of, I, I believe that one of the great challenges we have is anthropocentrism, everything centered around this human being. And one of my most... Um, Enjoyable experiences has been that when I went uh, apnea diving with the sperm whales um, to listen to them talk and then sit down with the scientists to actually follow their language. And you know, now with uh, the present computer science, we perfectly know what they're saying. We actually are able live to hear oh, uh, would you please take care of my baby? I'm going to go down and get some food. You know, and you see it happening before you and you hear the sounds and then they can actually retrace because the sperm whales speak in syllables. So very easy for computer science to, to track it. Then I write a story about it and I bring it to, to my students in China and so in one of these uh, typical Chinese meetings with thousands of kids there, all in English, all speaking English, I'm saying, okay, tell me, which language do you want to learn? Do you want to learn sperm whale or do you want to talk to the sperm whales? Or do you want to learn English to talk to our friends in America? Sperm whales. <laughs> of course they want to learn sperm whale language. I mean, it's obvious you don't even have to ask a child. Now, just in three minutes, the whole room switched around. And, and what did we really say? It's not that we are against America, but we're in favor of finally being able to talk these incredible beings with whom we share this planet. And, and this enthusiasm, well, today, there is already one school in China where the kids have the opportunity to start learn and understand sperm language, sperm whale language. Mm. And it is oversubscribed. You know, <laughs> everyone wants to know how can I talk to them. Now, <laughs> this is how we turn garbage around. Because why would children have to learn other languages when you have these automatic translators already today? Why would we bother Ingvar to say, don't say this, but say that, and don't say so, and say so? Forget about it. We understand each other. Language is about communicating, not about grammar perfectness. But what we need to have is language needs to be broadened to all sentient beings around us. All sentient beings. And that is dropping ignorance. Because we think we're the only sentient beings. But as one, at once we realize that there are some grand other sentient beings. And if you get into the details, then we figure out that the Lemurs, they can sing with the same vocalizations as we do, with sense behind it, not just making sounds. And then we, re and we realize one after the other that actually there's so much communication going on that we have lost the capacity to perceive that actually everyone is talking and everyone is listening. But the only one who's only talking humans 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that seems to overlap quite a bit with a yogic world of worldview that everybody is communicating. Actually, communication uh, is everywhere. Yeah, sometimes uh, it's like it's not joke. Actually, sometimes I listen what the birds talking, you know, about something. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, <coughs> sorry, if you if you you know become free from garbage. And you know your your properties of con consciousness. You can use them properly. If you know what is intention, you know uh, you become able to incredible things, to the incredible things. It's uh, you know all those uh, esoteric things. They become practical things. They're not not esoterical anymore. You know. It's our capacity as real humans, true self, it's unlimited, right? It's unlimited. And uh, those things what we are doing for our daily life, they're not interesting, you know? That what is beyond them, and beyond those things, beyond those things, it's uh, something what you even cannot imagine, you know? But if you have your thoughts only about something, you're so limited because, because this is your main topic. You cannot go over it because you are stuck here, right? Stuck here with your reactions, not only information, emotions, and other things. You are you are limited. You are so strongly limited. You are like in the small box in the eternal universe. Go beyond the limits, out from box. So guys, we are approaching the limit of time we have today, and maybe just to close this off with a one last question to both of you, but a very grand one and very important one. And so in light of today's topic, or maybe even in a broader sense, how to end human suffering? Why only end human suffering? Why don't you end all suffering? not just human suffering. I mean, let's not forget that uh, just in the United Kingdom, they're doing 4.5 million tests on animals to approve a drug, putting them in pain and killing them. So I think we need to end all suffering. What about the reindeer then? Oh, well, the reindeer that gets into the tree because it got drunk, or which one? It <laughs> got into the, the sleeping bag. <laughs> <laughs> or the reindeer that was put on a truck because uh, the Scandinavians have put so many ski ranges up now that uh, reindeers are trekking by truck and not anymore trekking by their own forces. So I, I think we have to have this consciousness that suffering by us is caused all around. But there's some, like the plant, who's delighted to, to know that it's being eaten for its grandness, and it has no problem because it doesn't consider one plant as an individual. It considers all the plants as the ones who will cut and you regrow, and you cut and we will see it again. I mean, how could a carrot be unhappy that it's being eaten when it delivers you the next year 700,000 seeds to create 700,000 carrots. I mean, carrots want to be generous and have more than we need. Unfortunately, we have created an economic system whereby we prevent from all basic needs to be met. And by not succeeding meeting all those basic needs, we succeed in creating a lot of suffering. Poverty is part of the system. Suffering is part of the design. Sorry. That's part of the garbage we need to get out. Yeah. I, uh, I said, I, I like to say different a little bit. Whatever kind of sufferings we have or other, others have, which one are uh, um, made by us? reason for it is ignorance, only ignorance. But it's very wide, wide ignorance. It's unknowing. We think we know, and we know we know, but it's still it's ignorance. 
Only ignorance mm. can make suffering, nothing more. I mean, very wide. It's not local ignorance, you know, but it's, it's wide, widely spread. It's, it's actually become spread by history, you know, by, uh, by our uh, ancestors, through traditions, through traditional knowledge. Not all traditional knowledge is garbage, sorry. Some of it, them is very good. But, but education, basically, true education, we learned ignorance. And uh, so long time, we had how, or, or if we continue with it, suffering doesn't end. We need a lot of changes of views. Well, Ingvar, Gunther, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and knowledge and insights. I enjoyed it a lot. I hope everyone else did as well. We had viewers from, I see, 19 different countries. Mm. So I, I do believe you made a contribution to, to spreading your knowledge and insight to everyone. Thank you for good questions, you and the uh, audience too, right? Yeah, for, thank you, Gunther. Thank you for... Yeah. It was a pleasure to talk with you. Have a good evening. Goodbye.